Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. If you're a guest today, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here. We're studying through the life of Moses, this guy that was a refugee out in the desert, leading a million refugees through the desert. Um, for our regulars around here, I want to thank Pastor Alan Smith for filling in for me last week while I went to Dallas and practiced the sermon that I'm going to be with you today. So we're going to talk about faith. And because it's Independence Day weekend, we're going to talk about the faith of a nation, but we're also going to talk about your faith individual. And today I want you to start to think about what happens when the faith of a nation falters. But what about you? What does it really look like for you personally when you exercise faith? In order to set this whole thing for, up, for us up today, I'm going to show you a video right off, the bat, right off of the bat. And I want you to watch this video carefully. And at the end of the video, I'm going to ask you to answer this question. When did this guy really exercise faith? He says a lot about his life and a lot about how he tried to get his life changed or his life turned around. But when did his faith become real? Watch this video and then tell me after the video is over with, when did he exercise his faith? First year I played football, um, I played running back. I went out and scored like, you know, 50 touchdowns in a year. And I just kind of knew uh, then that football was a possible avenue for success for me. Going into my ninth grade year, I'm introduced um, to marijuana. I'm introduced to alcohol. I'm introduced to uh, sex. This is a 14-year-old kid uh, dealing with this stuff. And I didn't have a father figure around to teach me, you know, what all that meant. All I had was to look to were the guys in the streets, which was drug dealers, guys who had criminal records, and you know, that was my heroes, you know. I was looking up to those guys. So I just figured I was supposed to do what they did. I wanted to show them that I wasn't scared. I tried to jack um, another kid for his wallet, and I ended up getting in trouble and getting um, expelled from school. I remember my mom calling me on the phone and just hearing her brokenness when she answered the phone. You know, just like, DeMario, what have you done? And when she said that, it was almost to the point of, you have messed up your life. And I remember uh, being out running the streets with some of my friends, and we were breaking in cars. I punched the window, and I cut my arm up. And I have this uh, serious gash in my arm. And I felt like this was the first time I heard an audible voice from God. And he said, that's strike number two. The first strike was you getting kicked out of school. The second strike is you almost killed yourself tonight. If it would have been a few inches down, I could have gashed my wrist and died that night. That scared me to the point of, from the rest of my junior and my senior year, I cleaned up my act. But the fruit of my life still isn't changed. I get back and I'm like, all of a sudden I'm at this college and now I'm a small fish in a big pond. So I feel like I gotta prove myself all over again. So I go back to drink and I go back to smoke and I go back to partying and I land myself in jail. We stealing groceries out of Walmart. And I just remember looking around and like, whatever I'm trying to do with my life, it isn't working. I had a chance to make it out and now my coach can take my scholarship and I'd be sent back home. And I, and I messed up my opportunity before I even played a snap on the field. Fortunately, the coach did not kick me off the team. He gave me another chance. Because a little while later, our team chaplain who I've been going to Bible studies with, he started to spend time with me in the Word. He was talking about, you know, these radical ideas that I had never even thought about. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. And he was talking about, this is talking about your heart. So my whole theory with God was, at the end of the day, God, you know I got a good heart. Well, this was showing me that I had a bad heart because nothing but bad fruit was coming from my life. But then he told me something that was reassuring and encouraging. He said, God will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that night I went home and I was scared and I just prayed. It was the most sincere prayer I'd ever prayed. I said, God, I need a new heart. That's all I said, God, I need a new heart. I let go and I said, God, I'm trusting you. I don't know where you're gonna take me. And he's brought me closer and closer to him. I like about Demario Davis's story is that he's this guy who tries to clean his act up and on paper it looks like back in high school when he stopped drinking and stopped getting in trouble that his faith became real but he tells you as soon as I got to college I went back to the same old lifestyle nothing really was different on the inside so the question that I asked you just a second ago is when did that man's faith become real you tell me when was it sincere when did it become real? Let me hear you say it. 
It's when he prayed, God, I need a new heart. It's when God gave him a heart of flesh that that faith became real. You see, going to church, cleaning your act up, all of those things, that doesn't mean that faith is real. Faith is where you take a step, where you exercise belief in something that you can't see, and then when you take that step, God meets you there. And in Mario's case, changed his life, turned him around and changed his life. Today, we're going to talk about faith. And we're going to look at ancient Israel as an example of faith. If you're following along in that mobile app, you got some uh, sermon notes in front of you. If you're following along by paper, would you write this down? A couple of things that we're going to learn about faith today. One is faith takes courage. Every act of faith takes courage. We're going to spend most of our time in Numbers chapter 14 today, but in order for you to really understand what's going on in Numbers 14, we've got to look at the end of Numbers 13. This is the nation of Israel. The entire nation are a bunch of refugees wandering through the desert. God has delivered them miraculously from slavery in Egypt, and he's promised them the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. For 400 years, God has been making this promise. Well, today, Israel's right at the edge of the promised land. God has brought them to the very point that 400 years of Israel has been longing for and looking forward to. Before they go and enter the promised land, Moses, the leader of the country, like a good general, he decides to send 12 men across the river to go check out the land, go see a couple of things. Tell me, is the land really good? Tell me about the military in the land. And at the end of Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 25, these 12 guys come back across the river and they give a report, not just to Moses, but to all of Israel. And here's their report after a 40-day reconnaissance mission in the promised land. Verse 25 of Numbers 13. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land that you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. I want you to just pause for a second at verse 27 because Moses has sent these people across the river and basically God is making some pretty awesome claims about this land. God has been using terminology like this is a land that flows with milk and honey and this is a nation of farmers and shepherds. So Moses sends them over there to check it out. Look, did God exaggerate? Is the land really as awesome as he claims that it is. And these 12 guys come back and they say, we can't even use words to tell you how great this land is. In fact, you wouldn't believe us if we told you, so we brought back some fruit to show you. This land is beyond your wildest dreams. I'd like to put it this way. For a nation of farmers and shepherds, any moron can make money when we go across the river. Anybody can make a living in that land. But then Moses asked them the question, yeah, but what about the military that's in that land? And when this issue comes up, Israel is now in a crisis. Israel is now facing a challenge because now Israel is going to have to show some real courage. Verse 28, but the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Here's what's going on. They go across the river, they look at the land, they see if we can raise sheep, can we raise crops there? It's beyond your wildest dream. And then Moses asks them, tell us about our military. And here's the report that these guys give. We are totally outnumbered. There's no way our nation can be successful if we go to war against the military on the other side of that river. And their cities are humongous and built like fortresses, like castles. This is what we're up against. And on top of all of that, they have a race of super soldiers over there. If we go across that river, we are going to get annihilated. You see, Israel is being asked to do something that is totally over their head. And everyone realizes it. And what God is asking Israel to do is to show some real courage and to take a step of faith. 
You'll see this in just a second. For 10 of these 12 men, when they were over across that river, the only thing that they could see is obstacles. The only thing that they could see is this overwhelming problem. We can't be successful if we go to war against that nation. For two of the 12 men that are over there, they see something different. They see the power of God. And they see as long as God is on our side, we're going to be okay. If God's not on our side, we're in deep trouble. You see, Israel really only has one mission when they go across that river, to trust God and to show some faith, to show some courage and believe that God will meet them over on the other side of that river if they do that. What you're going to see from Numbers 14 today is Israel fails miserably here. Israel doesn't have the courage to cross that river. And I want to ask you personally, in your heart, when you're facing these terrifying circumstances, when you're in over your head, when your faith is real and it's serious, I mean, when your fears are real and serious, and now you've got this war going on inside your chest between fear and faith, which one of the two wins in your life? Because being afraid, showing an act of faith doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It means that in the midst of the fear, I step out and I trust God. And that's what God is asking Israel to do in Numbers 13. Look at how they respond in Numbers 14, starting in verse 1. God is placing a challenge in front of Israel. And the challenge is to trust him and to trust only him. But I just want you to hear from me, church. Every act of faith is a challenge. If you're not challenged, I don't believe it really is an act of faith. I like to say it this way. There is no such thing as safe faith. If you want safe faith, it's not faith. And if you're going to exercise faith, it by its very definition can't be safe. God's placing this challenge before Israel and he's asking Israel to trust him. And this is Israel's response, Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us into this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. The story is tragic that you're hearing in the Bible. They have this opportunity to show their faith, but instead of showing their faith, they start to weep at the circumstances that they're in. Like, God, we don't want to be here right now. We don't want to have to go across that river and to face that military. And then they go from weeping to wrath. Read the rest of Numbers chapter 14 today. They're so angry with Moses that they're ready to kill Moses for getting them in this situation. I guess they just conveniently forgot that God is literally leading them every day through a visible sign of his presence by this pillar of cloud during the day, this pillar of fire at night. It's not like Moses came up with this plan. This is exactly where God wants them. And they're so upset that they would rather kill Moses. But here's what's tragic about what you see on the screens. They would not only rather kill Moses, they would rather go back to Egypt. They're saying, I would rather be a slave in Egypt than a free man in the promised land if it takes us going across that river and battling that enemy. You know what? Forget it. We're not going to do it. And the nation of Israel has this challenge in front of them. And the nation misses it completely. This challenge is in front of you. Every time you're scared, every time you're facing a crisis, every time you're in over your head, you face the same challenge that ancient Israel faced. Is God big enough to handle your circumstances? Or are you going to have to go through it all on your own? That's really the challenge. Last week, I was walking through the airport at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, and uh, everybody in the airport was paying attention to what was on the screens. I couldn't really hear it, but I could see it, and I could see that everybody in the terminal was freaking out about this video on the screens at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. You see, they were showing this video of this Air Asia flight that left Australia on the way to Malaysia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, nowhere to turn around, no way to get out of this airplane, massive maintenance emergency. 
In fact, a dude with his phone shot a video, and here's what everybody was watching at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. You probably saw this on the news. This maintenance emergency was an engine that had a huge malfunction. The out malfunction was so severe that it caused the entire plane to shake like a washing machine on spin cycle. Now, in order to make matters a little bit worse, if you're in that situation, it's totally out of your control. There's nothing you can do at this point as a passenger on that plane to fix the airplane. And here's what the pilot does. He gets on the intercom and he says, this would be a good time for you to start praying. Now, I'm certain when that announcement comes across the intercom on the pilot, or from the pilot over the Indian Ocean, you're gonna start to freak out. And you're going to start to wonder, is God big enough to handle these circumstances that I'm going through right now? And I would love to know what's happening in the hearts of the people in that plane when it's shaking violently and they're looking at the Indian Ocean and thinking, I'm never going to see my family again. You see, it's not the fear that means you have no faith. It's what you do when you are afraid that shows what your faith is really made of. Here's what I want you to know, church. Here's the whole sermon for today in one sentence. Please write this down. Write it in your notes. Put it in the margin of your Bible. Here's the truth. Your faith shines brightest when your fears are darkest. It's in that moment when you're terrified that you really show people what you believe. You can say it until you're blue in the face, but it's when you're terrified that people really get a chance to see what you really believe. You see, what you behave is really what you believe. It's not what you say. It's what you behave that tells people what you believe. And your faith shines the brightest when your fears are darkest. And right now is a dark moment for Israel. And Israel lacks the faith to follow God. And so now Israel has a choice to make. And Israel fails God miserably at this choice. Here's the choice of faith that you and I have to make when you're scared too. And it's found in Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. Let me, show, let me tell you what you're seeing in the Bible today. When Moses and Aaron fall face down, this is an extreme display of begging the people of Israel, don't do this, don't make this choice. This is a huge mistake. Tearing your clothes in the Old Testament is the greatest demonstration of grief that you can do. This is Joshua and Caleb's way of mourning for losing something very dear to them. And if you wanna know what just died in Israel, faith. That's what just died in Israel. In fact, a dream that Israel's had for 400 years is dying right in front of their eyes. And these four men are begging Israel, don't do this, don't make this choice. Here's what they say. Then they, then they said to all of the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It's a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Basically, do you know what's waiting for you across that river? But notice this, verse 9. But do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land. Reverse that sentence. If you act out of fear, it is an act of rebellion because you're not trusting God. They're only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Here's the national argument that's going on. Four men, Moses, Aaron, Caleb, Joshua, are saying the exact same thing that the rest of Israel is saying. We're not big enough. We're certainly not strong enough as a nation to go across that river and to defeat that enemy. And that's what the rest of these 12 the rest of these 10 men are saying, at this point, this is what all of Israel is saying. We can't win this battle. But for these four men, they're saying, but there is still another factor in the equation. 
If God goes across that river with us, we can't lose. If God doesn't go across that river with us, we can't win. So the only choice before us is, is God going across that river with us or not? The rest of the nation of Israel, like a cancer spreading through the ranks, the rest of the nation of Israel start to act out of their fear. They want nothing to do with a battle across that river. In fact, they decide, you know what? We're not going. And Moses, you can't make us go across that river. And as a result, they act this choice that they make, this choice of faith. They act out of fear instead of faith. And it costs them. It costs them severely. For our regulars around here, you know that we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of the men who helped hand our faith to us, who shaped our faith. We call it the Luther 500, and we're doing a little bit of looking at who are these great leaders who helped hand the faith once and for all delivered to the saints to us. The guy I want you to know about today, a guy by the name of John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was born outside of London, educated at Oxford, was a brilliant leader of the church. And Wycliffe started to step away from the authority and the control of the church. In fact, Wycliffe believed that you didn't need to go through the church to have access to God. This was extremely controversial in Wycliffe's day. In fact, he was criticized for it. Wycliffe believed you have access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And anybody who knows Jesus has the ability to speak to God directly. Here's how Wycliffe put it in one of his letters. Trust wholly in Christ. Rely altogether on his sufferings. Beware of seeking to be justified by any other way than Jesus' righteousness. See, the church controlled the people in Wycliffe's day because the church controlled the Bible and the people couldn't read the Bible in their own language. So John Wycliffe set out to translate the Bible into the language of the people. And he was hated for this. In fact, he was ostracized and excommunicated because he believed the people should be able to read the Bible for themselves and have access directly to God. He was so hated for this that they referred to Wycliffe's Bible as the vulgar Bible. It was vulgar in the eyes of the church to give people a Bible that they can read in their own language. And the church hated him so much that after his death, 43 years later, they dug up his body and desecrated his remains and then sprinkled his ashes in the swift river. That's how much they hated this man. But church leaders forgot is that river flows into the sea and the sea flows into the ocean and what Wycliffe started became a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, the Wycliffe Bible translators exist today to give people the Bible in their very own language so that they can have access to God one-on-one -on -one, just like John Wycliffe started many centuries ago. John Wycliffe is one of those great leaders of the faith that you and I should look back on and thank God God for men that had that kind of courage, that he was willing to step up and to act on his beliefs. And when you believe enough, you're willing to bet it all. You're willing to risk it all on what you believe. Wycliffe was, and God asks his people to risk it, risk it all on what you believe. There's a high cost to exercising faith, but you know what? There's an even greater cost for unbelief. And at the end of the book of Numbers, I don't have the time to go all the way through chapter 14 with you today. At the end of Numbers 14, you see the cost of unbelief. Here's what's happened. The people have said, Moses, we refuse to go across that river. In fact, we are going to go back to Egypt and we would rather be slaves in Egypt than free people in the promised land. So Moses goes back up the mountain to beg God on behalf of the people. This is an act of rebellion. Moses knows it. And Moses is going to ask God, God, would you please be merciful? Would you please spare this people for what they just did to you? And at the end of Numbers 14, God speaks for the first time in verse 20. And here's what God says to Moses. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you've requested. But as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with my glory, I need to under explain these two phrases. God says, 
I will bet my life on what I say next. In fact, if what I say next doesn't come to pass, then I am not God. Here's what's going to happen next, Moses. Here's the cost for their unbelief. Verse 22, not one of these people will ever enter that land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs that I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness, but again and again, they've tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. God is saying, Moses, I showed them power that nobody on earth has ever seen in Egypt. I am with them literally, visibly in their presence every day. I give them food to eat. They've heard my voice on the mountain and still they don't believe me. Oh, Moses, not one of these people are going to step foot into the promised land. Moses, I'm going to annihilate the entire nation of Israel. A whole generation is going to die in the desert for what just happened at the edge of the promised land. But two men, and only two men, will step foot into the promised land. Joshua will ultimately lead Israel across the river, and Caleb will go with them. They will never see the land I swore to give to their ancestors, the Lord says. None of those who have treated me with contempt will ever see it. But my servant Caleb, he's different. He has a different attitude than the others. He's remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land that he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. God is making a distinction. Israel, you didn't believe that I was big enough, that I was strong enough to give the land to you, and so you're going to die in the desert. Two men had the courage to follow me across that river. Two men believed that I was big enough to deliver them against that enemy, and those two men, and only those two men, will inherit the promised land. That's not the full cost. Here's the full cost, verse 25. Here's what happens as a result of Israel's lack of faith. But now, turn around. Don't go towards the land of the Amalekites and the Can where the Canaanites and the Amalekites live. Tomorrow, you must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. Do you see what just happened here on the screens? God said, Moses, go right back where you came from. You spend the rest of your life walking in the desert, wandering around as refugees for 40 years, lost in the desert because you didn't believe. This nation didn't believe that I was big enough to hand them. This is a small thing for me, but the nation of Israel didn't believe that I was big enough to deliver those foreign armies over to them. And because of that, I'm going to give you a 40-year stay of execution. But Moses, every single one of these people will die in the desert and their children. Maybe their children are courageous enough to follow me across that river and to believe that I'm big enough and strong enough to give them the land that I'm promising, that I've been promising all the way back to Abraham. See, the truth is, you spell the word faith, S-T-E-P. You have to take a step. It's a step into the unknown and it's scary. And God says, if you'll take that first step, I'll meet you there. And when you take that first step, I'll give you the courage. My Holy Spirit will be with you to give you the ability to take the second step. And when you take that second step, you can look back with some confidence and have the courage to take the third step. But it all starts with the first step. If you'll just trust me enough to take that first step, I'll meet you there. And I'll give you a reward for your faith, but you got to put your faith into action. Here's how the New Testament says this. Faith that doesn't have action is dead faith, and dead faith is no faith at all. So I want to ask you tomorrow, this week, when you're facing some big crisis, and you're in over your head, and you don't know how this thing is going to turn out, is God big enough? to meet you in the middle of that crisis? Is God big enough that he can give you the strength to handle whatever you're facing? If it's health or if it's marriage or if it's finances, whatever it is, that's waiting for you around the corner that you don't even know is coming. Is God strong enough? Is he big enough to meet those needs? You see, it's gonna take a step of faith and if you'll take that first step, he'll meet you there. 
And he'll, take, he'll give you the ability to take that second and third step. And the whole journey of faith, the walk with Jesus Christ, it begins with a step of faith, of simply saying, God, I can't do this on my own. My sins are too big. I have a heart of stone. I need a heart of flesh. In just a second, I'm going to close this sermon with a prayer. I'm going to pray for everybody in this room. Maybe for somebody in this room who's never taken that first step of faith, who's never surrendered your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, I'm going to pray for you. But for those of you in this room who know Christ personally, who need to take that step of faith when you're facing challenges, when you're dealing with real big fears, I'm going to pray for you, that you'll reach out and you'll trust God and see how God meets you in the midst of your challenges. Would you bow your heads? Let me pray for us. And would you ask the Holy Spirit to start to speak to you and to prompt you to respond to what you're hearing from the Bible today by taking a next step. Father, I pray for people that are all over in this room right now. God, maybe some of them are struggling with faith and maybe some of them are dealing with some severe challenges right now and they're scared about how this thing is going to turn out. Father, would you give your children, the people who genuinely know Christ, the ability to step on you knowing that you will meet them if they will take that step of faith, that you will be right there with them, that you never leave them, that you'll walk with them through these terrifying circumstances. And Father, would you help them to have the courage to show the people around them how big you are by the fact that they're willing to step out and to trust you and you meet them there. God, I also pray, though, for people in this room who maybe need to surrender to your son Jesus for the first time. Would you cause somebody in this room to start the journey of faith, to take the first step of faith by simply saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. I realize I need a heart transplant. I realize I have a heart of stone and I need a heart of flesh and my bad deeds come from a bad heart. And so I'm asking you right now, right here today, for the first time in my life, I'm real and I'm serious about this. Would you forgive me? Would you change me? Would you make me into a new man or a new woman from the inside out? God, maybe some people have been really struggling with their faith and they need to put that faith on display and trust that you love them and that you're a good God and that you will meet them there if they will trust you with it. Whatever it is, Father, Would you cause your people to take the next steps and to do something with what they've heard from the Bible today? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.